Now in Job chapter 9, beginning verse 1, the Bible reads, Then Job answered and said, I know it is so of a truth, but how should man be just with God? If he will contend with him, he cannot answer him one of a thousand. Now in verse 1, it says that he's answering what Bildad the Shuhite had said in chapter 8. So let's look at what Bildad had just said at the end of chapter 8. He says in verse number 20, Behold, God will not cast away a perfect man. Neither will he help the evildoers, till he fill thy mouth with laughing and thy lips with rejoicing. They that hate thee shall be clothed with shame, and the dwelling place of the wicked shall come to naught. And this is the same argument that both Eliphaz and Bildad and his friends will continue to use, just basically summed up as, if you do good, everything's going to go great for you. And if you do wrong, then you're going to be punished and things are going to go badly for you. And bad things don't happen to good people and good things don't happen to bad people, which is what we today would call a prosperity gospel where you know your best life now and 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 uh, you just name it claim it and all this kind of uh, nonsense of the TV preachers who they have a lot of wealth and they have good looks and and success and it's because they're so righteous that's what they want you to believe it's not biblical the Bible says yeah, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The Bible says, for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. The Bible says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but, but out of them all the Lord delivers them. So in this passage here, he's saying, God's not going to cast away a perfect man. You know, God's not going to let bad things happen to you if you're doing right. So Job answers in verse one of chapter nine and said, verse two, I know it is so of a truth but how should man be just with God? He's saying, okay, I understand that if I do right, I'm going to be blessed. And if I do wrong, I'm going to be punished. There is some truth in what Bildad is saying, but he's saying, how can man be just before God? What he's saying is that no one is completely just before God. No one's completely righteous. No one is without sin. No one is what we would think of today as perfect. Jump down to verse number 20. It says in verse 20 of chapter 9, if I justify myself, mine own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I am perfect, it shall also prove me perverse. So here he's saying that if he were to claim to be sinless, if he were to claim to be justified by his own goodness, that would be perverse or crooked. That would condemn him. Now this reminded me of when Jesus says in the New Testament, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. The Bible says that we will be condemned or justified based on our words. And here he says, if I justify myself, mine own mouth shall condemn me. He's saying he'll be condemned by his own words. Meaning that God will use his own words against him to condemn him. The fact that he claimed to be justified by his own righteousness. Okay, And so the way that we would apply that to salvation is that those who are trusting in themselves to get themselves to heaven, those who are trusting in their own works, their own words are condemning them because one day they'll be judged by their works and they will come up short and be found wanting. Those who have confessed with the mouth the Lord Jesus and believed in their heart that God has raised them from the dead, they will be justified by their words. Just like uh, the Ethiopian eunuch was justified by his words when he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He didn't say, I believe I'm going to heaven because I'm a good person or because I live a good life. Uh, when we talk about being justified by ourselves or justified by the deeds of the law, justified means you are declared righteous. Because if you notice, the first four letters of justified are just. Just is a word that's used in the Bible synonymously with righteous. When it talks about Lot, it says, He delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. In the next breath, he said, for that righteous man. So you use the word righteous and just interchangeably. So justified means that you are declared righteous. Okay, you, 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 we're not righteous of ourselves, we're sinners, but when we believe on Jesus Christ, he imputes the righteousness of Jesus Christ unto us, and so we are there for declared righteousness, not by our own good deeds, but by the righteousness which is of faith, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So, justified 
by our, our faith in Christ, not justified by the deeds of the law. It's funny, I was out soul winning today, and I talked to this guy, and he was apostolic, and so he believed that you could lose your salvation. Okay, yeah, I was trying to explain to him, salvation's by faith, it's not by works, and he says, well, it's not by works, but, but, you know, if you, if, you, if you just go out and sin, if you don't live the life, this and that, you know, you're not saved and this and that. And so I say, you know, do you have a Bible verse for that? And he said, no, you know, I don't know. He said, it's in there. You know, I have it written down at home, he said, but I don't, you know, I don't have it off the top of my head. So then he continued along, you know, I, I tried to show him more scriptures and he continued with that. And he just kept saying over and over again, he kept saying, you know, uh, I believe you can fall from grace, though. He said, I just believe you can fall from grace. I said, well, do you have a verse on falling from grace? No. But you know what? There is a verse on falling from grace. Go to Galatians 5. Galatians chapter 5. And, and this is so ironic that people would actually use this verse to try to teach a works-based salvation where you have to keep the law or keep the commandments to stay saved. Because what's the difference if you have to keep the commandments to get saved or keep the commandments to stay saved? It, you're still doing works to be saved. Yeah. It's the same thing. So if you believe you can lose your salvation, that's the same as saying you got to work to get it. I mean, what's the difference? But look what it says in Galatians 5, verse 4. It says, Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law... You're fallen from grace. So the verse that they're trying to use to say, oh yeah, you know, you live a life from sin, you can fall from grace, is actually a verse that's telling you that you can't be justified by the law. He says, those of you that uh, are justified by the law are fallen from grace. Now let me ask you something. Is anybody really justified by the law? No. 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 Because the Bible says, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. It's not possible for someone to be justified by the law. So when he says to them, whosoever of you are justified by the law, are they really justified? By no, he's saying those of you who think you're justified by the law, you know, the ones who want to be saved by keeping the law, that believe that they are saved by works. Obviously, they aren't really saved. But he says, Christ become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. And so these are people who, uh, as a group, the churches of Galatia, had initially believed in salvation by faith when Paul originally came and he preached the gospel to them. And it was all about faith. Well, then other people came in and, and corrupted those churches and got them to where they're teaching work salvation, where they're teaching you have to be circumcised to be saved. You have to keep the commandments of God to be saved. And so when he say that ye did run well, we got to remember, he's not talking to the individual. Okay. Because ye is plural, right? Thee and thou is singular. Ye is plural. He's talking about as a group. Okay. Th these church, it'd be like if I said, man, this used to be, a great church, and now it's, it's filled with unbelievers. I'm not saying that those people used to be saved, and now they're not saved, okay? It would mean that I'm saying the church has become a bad church. And plus, a lot of these people throughout the book of Galatians, he thought they were saved, but now that he sees them going into this doctrine, right. he doubts their salvation. You know, he's not sure, really, have these people just gotten confused on doctrine? Did somebody just come in and confuse them? Or maybe these people just never really understood the gospel in the first place. Maybe they weren't even saved. He says, I, you know, I'm afraid of you lest I bestowed labor upon you in vain. And he, he doubts them just like he doubted a lot of the Corinthians, whether they were even saved because of the fact that they were so easily moved from the grace of him that called them unto another gospel. Okay. And so that the whole book of Galatians just demolishes work salvation. I mean, that's what the whole book is about from chapter one to chapter six. I mean, it just hammers the fact that it's all by faith, that it's not of works, and that, and that it's not by keeping the law. And those who believe in work salvation, they play a semantic game where they say, well, works, that's when you're doing good deeds. That's when you're doing good works. And that doesn't save us, but you do have to stop sinning. 
And they think stopping sinning is not works. But in reality, the Bible classifies keeping God's commandments as the deeds of the law. Anytime you're following God's law. So if God's law says, thou shalt not steal, and you don't steal. And God's law says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. And you were, you know, in the Old Testament, you're not, keep, you know, you're, you're not working on the Sabbath. And the Bible says, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And you're not taking God's name in vain. The Bible calls that the deeds of the law. Right. Because you're being a doer of the law. Right. Not just a hearer, you're a doer. You're hearing the command and you're doing it. Okay, even if it means not doing something, that is still called the deeds of the law. And the way that I prove that is in Galatians chapter 2, he actually, uh, let, me, let me go there real quickly in Galatians chapter 2. In verse number 16, it says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin, God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For though I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live, for I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live, in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. You know, why did Jesus Christ even die on the cross if keeping the law gets you there? It doesn't even make any sense. And it didn't, Jesus didn't just come just to add a new requirement to salvation. It used to be you're saved by keeping the law. Now you're saved by keeping the law and believing in Jesus. Yeah. What in the world sense would that make? The whole point why Jesus even died on the cross is that no one can live a perfect life. No one can follow all of the commandments perfectly. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we need to be justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And so over and over again in uh, Galatians, he just hammers this and drives this in that we're not saved by the law. And, and we're not saved by either good works or by the works of the law. Okay, Do, being a doer of the law, following God's laws. And, and look, Jonah 3.10 just nails it because it says, And God saw their works, comma, that they turned from their evil way. Yep. Right. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do it, and they did it not. Look, that shows that your works can be turning from your evil way. That's your works. Okay, if you had a guy and, and these people are hypocrites, they'll basically look at it and say, oh, that's not works. When you turn from your sins, repenting of your sins, that's not works. But it's hypocrisy because if you take a guy who joins their church and gets baptized, right? And then he doesn't do any soul winning. But if they saw him quit drinking and if they saw him quit the drugs and quit smoking and if they saw him quit watching uh, filth on television, and if they saw him get all this sin out of their life, they'd say, see, this guy's got the works to back up, you know. Yeah. This guy's got faith and works, because look how much he's changed. Right. You know they would. Because yeah. if I said, well, this guy doesn't have any works, they'd say, sure he does. He's quit drinking, he's quit smoking, he quit this, he's, you know. But then all of a sudden, when it comes to salvation, it's like, oh, that's not works, uh. But when it's somebody at their church that did it, they'd praise it as works. Because, of course, it's works. I mean, it's work to, to, to obey God's commandments, whether it's the positive commands or the negative commands. But anyway, back in Job, he says, how can man, how should man be just with God? And then he says in verse 20, if I justify myself, mine own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I am perfect, it shall also Prove me perverse. Verse 21, he says, though I were perfect, saying, like, even if I were perfect, yet would I not know my soul, I would despise my life. That's just him sinking back into grief there in verse 21. So let's back up to where we were in the chapter, though. Uh, verse 3, if one, if he will contend with him, he cannot answer him one of a thousand. Just saying that God's so much wiser than him that if he were to get in an argument with God, God would basically make a thousand points that he could not answer and he couldn't even he couldn't even answer one. 
of those points because God's wisdom and God's knowledge is so much higher than Job's. Look at verse 4. It says, He is wise in heart, talking about the Lord, and mighty in strength. Who hath hardened himself against him and hath prospered, which removeth the mountains and they know not, which overturneth them in his anger. So he asks the question there, who has hardened himself against God and has prospered? And the hardening of yourself or the hardening of your heart is something that we see a lot throughout Scripture, that term being used. Of course, uh, we think of, uh, of course, uh, Romans 1 is, a, is an example that pops to mind about uh, God hardening their heart. And uh, throughout the Bible, there are people who are stiff-necked and hard-hearted. And the opposite of that is when people are tender-hearted. That's the word that's used as the opposite of having a hard heart, is a tender heart. Go to 2 Chronicles 34, 26. 2 Chronicles 34, 26. Now, if you think about what it means to, to have a tender heart, I think that the best way to describe a tender heart would be a heart that is sensitive to the Word of God. For example, if I were to go out and injure myself, or let's say I just did something very strenuous and my muscles became very sore, then that area would be very tender to the touch. If I had an injury or a sore muscle, it would be very tender. And what does that mean? That it's sensitive. Because it means that if I just applied the least bit of pressure, it's like, oh, ah, oh, that hurts. Because it's very tender there. Now, the opposite of that would be something that is hardened, which we would call a callus, right? Let's say you had a callus on you. You could literally touch that callus and not even feel it because the skin has become hardened. So tender skin might be like the skin that's underneath your fingernail. You know, if you lost a nail, extremely tender, right? The nail, on the other hand, is hard. So, you know, you, you can even touch your nail and barely feel it. And, and it would take a, a, a lot to make it hurt. Whereas that tender skin, you just barely touch it and it hurts. Okay. Well, when the Bible talks about people having a tender heart, they're sensitive to the preaching of God's word. They, they hear God's word preach and it cuts them right to the heart. And it doesn't take much for them to be moved. It doesn't take much for them to take it to heart. The one who is hardened it's going to take a lot to get their attention. Look at 2 Chronicles 30. Uh, did I say 34? Let me show you an example here in uh, 2 Chronicles 34, starting in verse 26. And this is about Josiah. And it says in verse 26, As for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, so shall ye say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel concerning the words which thou hast heard. Because thine heart was tender, and thou didst humble thyself before God when thou heardest his words against this place and against the inhabitants thereof, and humblest thyself before me, and didst rend thy clothes and weep before me, I have even heard thee also, saith the Lord. Now, let's go back in the chapter and let's see what it meant for him to be tender. It says in verse 18, Then Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath given me a book, and Shaphan read it before the king. And it came to pass, when the king had heard the words of the law, that he rent his clothes. So when he heard it, he got upset, because he realized, I'm not doing these commandments. We're not doing these commandments. When he heard God's word, and he realized how severely he and his nation were in violation of it, it made him sad. It grieved him. It made him upset to the point where he tore his clothing. People in the Bible would often rip their clothes, put dirt on their heads, just to show how upset they are. And that's what it means to have a tender heart. It means when you come to church and the pastor preaches on soul winning, you're thinking to yourself, oh man, I need to go out soul winning. Or the pastor preaches against a certain sin that you've been involved in, you say, oh, ouch, man, that nailed me. I need to fix that. The one who's hardened, they just sit there, Preach on soul winning, they don't care. Been there, done that, not interested. You know, you start hitting on their sin, just bounces right off of them. And it takes a lot to get through to them. It takes a lot to get their attention. You know, the pastor would really have to preach hard and scream and yell. And even that might not even get through. And then God might have to punish them and chastise them in their life to get through to them. Cause some horrible thing to happen in their life just to get through to them because they're hardened. They're callous. They are not sensitive and tender to the Word of God. When we read the Bible, we should be sensitive 
to the voice of what God's saying to us. And when we see something in the Bible, we need to be sensitive to the, the corrections that we need to make in our life and not just be hardened and just not care, just sit back and just read the Bible. And it just, it just, it, it's like water off a duck's back. That's being hardened. And what does the Bible say in Job 9? Who hath hardened himself against him and hath prospered? No one. You know, if you want to prosper in the Christian life, you need to be like David who had a tender heart. And, and when you have a tender heart, it means that you have a conscience that will smite you when you do something wrong. You're tender to that. For example, David had a tender heart toward God. This is why he was a man after God's own heart, even though he made a lot of mistakes. He cut the, the robe of Saul's garment, right? He cut the hem of his, the skirt of his garment and his heart smote him because he had done that. Okay, he had a tender heart towards sin. Even just committing the smallest minor sin in light of what was going on, cutting off that part of his garment wasn't a big deal. But even that little sin, he said, oh man, I don't think I should have done that. So he was sensitive to that. He was tender to that. Uh, the hard-hearted person commits all kinds of sins and big sins and just doesn't even care. Doesn't even worry about it. They're just, they become dull to it. They become numb to it. And we can be hardened to a lot of sin and become desensitized to sin. For example, you know, if you watch TV every day, at first you're going to find it blasphemous. You're going to find it to be sensual and devilish. But as you watch it every day, you just get used to it. And you just get so used to it that it doesn't really prick your heart anymore. And you're not really sensitive to the fact that this is sinful because you become callous. And when we were hardened toward God, the preaching of God's word just, it just bounces right off of us. It doesn't sink in. When we read our Bibles, we don't apply it to ourselves. We, do you feel pain when you hear the preaching of God's word and the preaching is on sin that you're guilty of? Doesn't that hurt? It's supposed to hurt. If it doesn't hurt, then, you know, you're hardened. When you read the Bible and you realize that you're wrong, that you're in sin, that you're not living up to what God wants you to do, that should grieve you. That should make you weep and be sorrowful. That's having a tender heart. Hardened, you know, you don't care. So in, in Job 9, he says, who has hardened himself against him? And it's prospered. You can't fight against God. You want to just harden yourself and just say, well, I don't care what the Bible says. You know, I, I'm just going to live my life and I'm going to do it my way. If you harden yourself against him, you cannot win. God is so much stronger and mightier than you. It says in verse four at the beginning, he's wise in heart and mighty in strength. Verse five, it says, which removeth the mountains and they know not, which overturneth them in his anger. I mean, God could just rip up the mountains and just flip them over like, like Jesus flipped the tables in the temple. God could just, you know, flip over the mountains and you're going to harden yourself against him and shake your fist at God and say, you know, I'm going to do it my way. It doesn't, it's, it's ridiculous. It's ludicrous. We need to humble ourselves before him. Like the tender-hearted King Josiah who humbled himself and instead of just hardening himself saying, well, you know, you read me this book of the law, but we haven't been doing that for decades and that's just ridiculous. That's too hard. We can't do it. No, he wept and said, man, we should have been doing this stuff. We should have been following these commandments. Say, just saying, well, so what? It's just a book. Or, well, I know that's what the Bible says, but let's get back to reality. I mean, have you ever heard people talk that? I literally, I listened to a, a, a sermon uh, a few weeks ago that I downloaded off the internet from a pastor that I'd, I'd heard him preach in the past. I'd heard him preach in person. And this guy was preaching a sermon on marriage. So, I thought, oh, okay, you know, let's listen to the sermon. And he said in the sermon on marriage, he said, well, I know that's what, it, you know, I know Ephesians 5 says that wives are supposed to submit themselves, but, you know, it's just not, it's just not real. It's not really going to work that way. I mean, it's a Baptist preacher. And he said, he literally said, yeah, that's great theology, but, you know, that's going to work for about 10 minutes. No, that'll work for about 10 years. That'll work for about 70 years. That, you know, that'll work until Jesus comes. And, and to sit there and say, well, I know that's what the Bible says, but let's have a reality check. No, this is reality. Right. You're not living in reality if you think that the world's stupid way of doing things is better than the Bible's way of doing things. You need a reality check. This book is truth. Yeah. 
This book is reality. And he literally stands by the pulpit, calls himself a man of God, and says, well, I know that's theologically correct, but now let's get real. No, we're never more real than when we go literally exactly by what the Bible says. That's when you're being real. And so uh, this is the kind of... Uh, uh, garbage today that, that passes for preaching on marriage, uh, yep. apparently. But the Bible says here that God removes the mountains and they know not, which overturneth them in his anger, which shaketh the earth out of her place, and the pillars thereof tremble, which commandeth the sun and it riseth not, and sealeth up the stars, which alone spreadeth out the heavens and treadeth upon the waves. Of the sea. So this is just talking about God's power and God's might and God's greatness. Now I want to stop and point out something here because there's a verse here that some people have used to try to disprove the Bible and say that the Bible is not scientifically accurate. Look at verse 6. It says, which shaketh the earth out of her place and the pillars thereof tremble. And people will say that because the Bible teaches that the earth has pillars that therefore the, uh, the people who wrote the Bible thought that the earth was like a flat disc sitting on top of pillars. You know, and that God's going to like knock over those pillars and then the whole thing's going to come crashing down. That's basically what people would have you to believe. Now, I know that uh, when I met my wife, she had been raised Catholic, but she was probably what would be referred to as an agnostic when I met her. And she had never spoken to anyone in her entire life who did not believe in evolution. I mean, every person that she'd ever known. I mean, the Catholics, I, mean, I was doing a fire alarm one time in a Catholic school and they were teaching evolution as fact in the Catholic school. So she had never even heard anyone before me tell her that the Bible is without error and that evolution is a fraud. Never even heard it before until I said that to her. And she always thought that there's no way the Bible could really be perfect or God's word or true because of the fact that it contains these scientific inaccuracies. Like she thought that the Bible taught that the earth was flat and that it had like a dome above it and all these crazy things. She was just taught, yeah, this is what the Bible says. This is what Christians believe. But now with science, we know that it's different. When in reality, uh, the Bible is always far ahead of science. Now, people will often tell you that everyone thought that the world was flat before Columbus in 1492. And everybody thought he's going to sail off the edge of the earth when he, went, when he set sail. That's just simply not true. People have, pe people have always known that the earth is round. Always. From the beginning of time, all throughout history, all throughout the Dark Ages, whatever period of time you want to pick, people knew that the earth was round. Now, just because there was this huge class of people who did not know how to read at all, could not read anything, illiterate, living in their own filth, living in their own dung in medieval Europe because they're kept in darkness by the evil Roman Catholic Church, Okay, just because there are people that thought that the earth was flat just because they're uneducated and ignorant, that doesn't mean that that's what the scientific world or scholars of that time actually believed. Were there some people at that time who believed that the earth was flat? Yes. But throughout history, the majority of thinking people and educated people have always known that the earth is round. And there was even a, a Greek... Uh, philosopher who measured the size of the earth and he was only like a hundred miles off and he did that around I think 100 BC I forget the guy's name and he measured that that's pretty advanced to not only say it's round but to know exactly the size and everything like that and all you can show there are quotes from scholars all throughout the Middle Ages whenever you want that'll tell you that the world's round people knew that the world was round throughout history and they say, well, the, the Bible teaches that it's flat. And the Bible teaches that it's on pillars. And back when people believed the Bible, that's what people thought because they got that from the Bible. But then uh, once science came along, it fixed it. But really, people just got that just from being dumb and just being uneducated. They didn't get that from the Bible. That teaching was never found in the Bible. Now, if you would, 
flip over to, keep your finger in Job 9, flip over to 1 Samuel 2, 8, because there are two verses that talk about the earth being upon its pillars, okay? Uh, the other one is in 1 Samuel 2, verse 8. So we saw it in Job 9, let me read it for you again. Which removeth the mountains, and they know not, which overturneth them in his anger, which shaketh the earth out of her place, and the pillars thereof tremble. Okay, now let's look at 1 Samuel 2, 8. It says, He raiseth up the poor out of the dust, and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill, to set them among princes, and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he hath set the world upon them. So let's say, see, look, the pillars of the Lord, and he set the earth upon them. Okay, now go back to Job, and let's see if this holds water. Because this is one of the major things that they'll point at to try to find scientific inaccuracy in the Bible. Even though the Bible is usually rebuking their pseudoscience. Like, for example, the fact that doctors have washed their hands in basins of water for hundreds and hundreds of years. Now they wash it in running water, like the Bible said, you know, over 3,000 years ago, to wash your hands with running water. They, until 200 years ago, and, and, and in many cases, even much more recently than that, just had a, a, a little basin that all the doctors would just, sh they, they'd work on somebody, then go wash their hands, and then work on the next person. Do surgery on the next person, wash their hands in the same water. Spreading germs, making their hands dirtier than they were before. So many things where the Bible is so far ahead. The Bible clearly teaches, even within the same book of Job, where did I have you turn? Are you in Job? Yeah. Flip over to Job 26. Even within the same book of Job. So we don't even have to go to a different book of the Bible to prove that the Bible does not teach that the earth is flat and that it's setting upon uh, pillars the way that they would describe it. Go to Job 20, 26, verse 7. It says, and actually let's start in verse 6 just to get the context. It says, Hell is naked before him and destruction hath no covering. He stretcheth out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. So right here in the exact same book of Job, the Bible says that the earth is hanging upon nothing. Does that sound like he thinks that it's a, a, a flat disc resting upon pillars? Because how could you look at a flat disc resting upon pillars and say it's hanging on nothing. That wouldn't make any sense, would it? And I'm going to explain to you what the Bible means when it talks about the pillars and, and, and such. But just right there, that just shows you that their interpretation is wrong. Because here in Job 26, it says he hangs the earth upon nothing. Uh, for sake of time, I'm not going to turn there, but in Isaiah chapter 40, it says it is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. And the inhabitants thereof are like grasshoppers. Also, in this passage in Job 26, it says, He stretcheth out the north over the empty place, and hangeth the earth upon nothing. Now, the empty place is a pretty interesting statement. Because that's what space is. What is space? If, if I said, I like this apartment because it has a lot of space, what am I saying? Empty places. That's what space means. If we're out of space... If I said, okay, we had to get a new minivan because we were out of space. What are we out of? Empty places. And so this shows an understanding of the concept of space all the way back when the book of Job is being written. Because it's God's word. Because God's going to get everything right. He's going to nail the science. He's going to nail the history. Everything's going to be right because it's out of the mouth of God. And so we have the empty place or space. Um, that's what the Bible says. It's hanging on nothing in space. And it's round. It's a circle. But if you would, go to Deuteronomy 32, 22. Deuteronomy 32, 22. So let's stop and think about this. We, we've, let's look at all the evidence here. We've seen Job 9, 6, which says that uh, God shakes the earth out of her place and the pillars thereof tremble. So what does that verse tell us about pillars? Well, it just says that when there's an earthquake, it shakes. All right. Now, the verse right before it says this, which removeth the mountains and they know not, which overturneth them in his anger, which shaketh the earth out of her place and the pillars thereof tremble. Now, if you've been reading the Bible a lot, and especially if you read the poetic books, which the poetic books are which? Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. You'll notice how the poetry of the Bible works. 
This is how it works. It says things twice using different words. Have you ever noticed in Proverbs how it'll say it one way in the first half of the verse and then say the same thing another way in the second half? Well, the book of Job does that a lot, and that is something that you'll see in the poetic books of the Bible a lot, and even in a lot of the other books of the Bible. Very common feature in the Bible to say something twice in a row, two different ways. This is a poetic device that the Bible frequently uses. So it'll say it in different words. So he says in verse 5, which removeth the mountains and they know not, which overturneth them in his anger, which shaketh the earth out of her place, and the pillars thereof tremble. He's restating the same shaking kind of a cataclysm involving the pillars of the earth and the mountains. Now look at Deuteronomy 32, 22. It says in Deuteronomy 32, 22, For a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. Now this is not using the word pillars, but it's using the word foundations, okay? Something that is underneath the mountains, holding them up. So the pillars of the earth, the foundations of the mountains. Now go to Jonah 2, verse 6. Jonah 2, verse 6. I'm just trying to show you all the evidence here so you can understand what God's saying. Because he says in 1 Samuel 2, 8, the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he hath set the world upon them. Okay, in Job, he talked about the pillars of the earth in regard to the mountains and the foundations of the mountains being shaken. In Deuteronomy 32, we saw that the foundations of the mountains were set on fire when God's anger burned under the lowest hell. Okay. Now look at Jonah chapter 2. And, and Jonah chapter 2 is when Jonah is inside the belly of the whale. And he's praying to God from the inside of the belly of the whale. And of course, Jesus said in Matthew 12, 40, and as, Mo, as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So Jonah was in a whale's belly. Jonah was not in the heart of the earth, was he? Okay, was Jesus in a whale's belly? No, Jesus was in the heart of the earth. But it's symbolic. Jonah being in the whale's belly signifies Jesus being in the heart of the earth. Now look what it says in Jonah chapter 2, verse 6. And actually, let's back up. Let's get the context. Verse 2. And said, I cried by reason of mine affliction of the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Now, is Jonah literally in hell? No. But basically, this is a prophecy of Jesus. This is like when David said, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Was he talking about himself? No. No, he was talking about Jesus. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh see corruption. And in Acts 2, Peter explains to the, those from Judea that David wasn't talking about himself. They said, look, his body is there, it's decayed, it saw corruption, but he whom God has sent, you know, saw no corruption. So a lot of times when the prophets are speaking, they're not talking about themselves, they're prophesying of Jesus. So when David said, thou wilt not see, leave my soul in hell, it's not about him, it's about Jesus. What about the Ethiopian eunuch? He's driving down the road in the chariot, and he, what, what does he ask Philip? Because Philip says, understandest thou what thou readest? And he says, how can I accept some man should guide me? He said, tell me. And I'm paraphrasing, but he said, you know, is the prophet speaking of himself? Or is he speaking of some other man? And it was Isaiah 53. And of course, it was speaking of some other man, Jesus. And that's what Philip used. So David talked about, Jesus, but he said, that will not leave my soul in hell is actually about Jesus. Uh, Isaiah, when he talked about things in Isaiah, was referring to Jesus, even though it seems as if he's referring to himself. Like when he says, I gave my back to the smiters and my beard to them that plucked it off. Okay, Th those are things that are referring to Jesus. Well, in Jonah here, when he says in verse 2, out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice, he's not talking about himself, he's in the whale. He's prophesying of Jesus. Okay, keep reading. For thou hadst cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas. Is that him or Jesus? That's him in the midst of the seas. And the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Everything in verse 3 is literal to his situation. Whereas verse 2 was prophetic of Jesus Christ. It says in verse 4, Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. 
The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. Now, does that sound like Jonah or Jesus? Jonah. Seaweed wrapped around his head. He's in the waves, he's in the ocean, he's in the water. Okay, but now look, he transitions back to prophecy of Jesus because he says, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. Now, is that true of Jonah? No, no. he didn't go down to the bottoms of the mountains. He's, he's in the ocean, he's in the sea. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Now, does that apply to Jonah? Did Jonah go anywhere forever? Did he go to the whale's belly forever? No. Was he uh, inside of the earth? No, he was in the water. So this is about Jesus. This is compatible with verse 2, where he says he's crying out of the belly of hell. And when he says, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains, the earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. That's the resurrection. Do you see that? How can you be in the heart of the earth forever and be brought up from corruption and be resurrected? You know, that's the miracle, obviously, God is able to dwell outside of time, that Jesus Christ could suffer an eternity of punishment for all of our sins in a finite period of time, three days and three nights. And it says he's been brought up from corruption. Okay, so the reason that I point this out to you is because the key verse is verse 6. It says, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. So when you go down, according to the Bible, to the foundations of the mountains, to the bottoms of the mountains, to the pillars of the earth that basically are holding and stabilizing the bottoms of the mountains, the earth is about you. Now, what does it mean when he says the earth with her bars was about me forever? Well, the word about we would use what word in modern English, in, in, in contemporary English? What's that? Around. around. But about is the word that the Bible uses for around. Okay, when it says, you know, it's, you know, I'm trying to think of a good example of a Bible verse. that you, There's a lot of Bible verses that use about to mean around. You know, we're, we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. It means we're surrounded by witnesses. And when it says the earth was about me, so according to the Bible, when you're at the foundations of the mountains, when you went down to the bottoms of the mountains, when you are at the, 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 the pillars of the earth that are holding up the mountains, the earth is about you. The earth is around you. Does, does that teach that it's a disc on pillars like stilts? No. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, the pillars of the earth or the bars of the earth are something that is within the earth. And you say, well, I want to see those pillars. I want to see those bars. I want to see if those are really there. L listen, science man, you've never even been 10 miles below the surface of the earth. So how do you even know what is down there? How do you know what bars or what pillars or what kind of foundations exist underneath the crust? I mean, think about it. The earth is... 10,000 miles in diameter. The crust is less than 10 miles thick. And man has never penetrated the crust. Forget journey to the center of the earth. Somebody needs to write a sci-fi book called Journey Through the Crust. And you know what? If somebody wrote a book called Journey Through the Crust, the exciting tale of going 10 miles downward in the earth that is 10,000 miles across, that is 5,000 miles to the center, man can't even go 10. Did you hear that? 5,000 miles to the core. And what does core mean? Heart. The word core means heart. If you speak French, that's how you say heart, core. 5,000 miles to reach the center, we can't even go 10. But they'll tell you about the inner core and the outer core. The inner mantle and the outer, what in the way? How do you know? Oh, Pastor, you're just ignorant of science. They have ways of knowing. Okay, but how do they know that they're right? How do you test? Look, any device, any measurement has to be calibrated. Yep. You can't test anything without first calibrating it. Like, for example, when thermometers were invented, they didn't just draw lines on it and just get, well, this must be this temperature. No, no. 
you had to calibrate that thermometer. Here's how they'd calibrate a thermometer. They make it, they manufacture a thermometer. You know, this is going way back. They make a thermometer and then guess what they do? They, they, they get some water and they boil it. Okay. And at the point that the water reaches a boil, they can put a line on the thermometer and say, that's 100 degrees Celsius or that's 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And then they could get some water and get the freezing point. And then they could draw a line on the thermometer and say, okay, this is, you know, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. I, uh, who likes Fahrenheit better? So sick of Celsius. Uh, you know, speak English. No, I'm just kidding. And get rid of the metric system also while you're at it. Just, I'm just trying to just make every science person mad with this sermon. Just every way possible. Nuts to it. So Fahrenheit... You know, 32 degrees, 212 degrees. And then, you know, you might want to put another line on there for the human body temperature. You know, 98, you know, stick it under your tongue. Get the human body temperature, 98.6, right? And I realized this would not be exact, but this would get you in the ballpark. And then you could fill in all the other lines. With those three reference points of, okay, here's 98.6, here's 212. Here's, you could then fill in the stuff in between. Okay. But what if I just invented the world's first thermometer? Okay, and I just I just drew lines on it, and I just I I just said, well, right now it's uh, 54 degrees outside. I said, well, how do you know it's 54 degrees? Well, my my thermometer says it's 54 degrees. Okay, but how do you know that that thermometer has anything to do with reality? Because sometimes thermometers are broken and they don't read right. And the way that you'd know is you'd find something where you knew the temperature. I know that this water is 212 degrees because it's boiling. Is everybody understanding what I'm saying? If I have a thermometer, let's say I were to hand you two thermometers and say, one of these are broken. Figure out which one's broken. How would you do it? You know, you'd go somewhere and say, well, okay, I know that this water is boiling. It's 212 degrees. If the thermometer says 212 and you know it's 212, boom, it works. If not, you'll say this thermometer is faulty, faulty measurement. You know, you go to the ice water, do the same thing. Go to the human body temperature, do the same thing. Okay, these, these uh, dating methods of, you know, this is uh, 2,000 years old. This is 500 years old. This is 2,500 years old. The carbon dating. How do they calibrate that? They found objects where they knew how old it is. And they're like, well, we know how old this is. We know this is 50 years old. And then they test it, you know, or, well, we know this is 1500 years old and then we test it. But here's the thing. There's nothing that you can have in your hand and say, well, I know this is 60 million years old. Right. Let's calibrate this thing <laughs> because it's impossible to know that. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, is it possible to know that something's 80 years old? Yeah. yeah, you could say, I know this is 80 years old and then you could test it and then you know whether your machine is right. Okay, I could, I could get a measuring tape and find something where I know, okay, I know the tiles in my house are 12 inch tiles and I can see whether my measurement method is right or not. Okay, how in the world can you measure a machine that, and calibrate a machine that tells you what is underneath the surface of the earth? I mean, think about this, folks. Nobody's ever seen it. Nobody's ever been there. No one has any clue what's down there. Except Bible-believing Christians know that hell is down there. That's all we know. To sit there and say, okay, I'll tell you what percentage of what metal is in that core. Is just man professing himself to be wise and becoming a fool. No one knows what's even in the mantle, let alone the core. No one has ever been there. In fact, I read a scientific article. They say they're drilling down to the mantle. It's going to take them like 12 years. It's going to cost billions of dollars. And they don't even know if they're going to make it. And Brother Romero said they're not going to make it. Because he used to be in, in an industry that had to do with drilling and, and, and uh, drilling down into the bedrock and, and into the earth. It just, it's, it's so much harder than anyone can imagine. And it doesn't work. It, it's probably never going to happen. Okay, so to sit there and say, well, we know what's down there is ludicrous. No one knows what's down there. Okay, the only the closest thing we could get to it is just trying to piece together the descriptions in the Bible. And you see, if I had that thermometer, how does the thermometer work? The mercury expands and contracts with temperature. Let's say I marked out the zero line. Let's say we're doing Celsius. Let's say I mark out the zero and I mark out the hundred, you know, the boiling point and the freezing point. 
And what if I said, okay, now I'm going to use this thermometer to measure things that are negative 500 degrees Celsius. I mean, do I really know that that thermometer is still going to be accurate at those extremes? All I can really tell you if I've got the, the freezing point, the boiling point, and the human body temperature is I can tell you, well, in this range, it's accurate. But guess what? As you start to go to really hot temperatures, that thermometer might cease to be accurate. Because what's going to happen? The chemical can only expand so much. The thermometer is going to blow its top. Okay? Or it can only contract so small. And it might begin to expand or contract at different rates when you get to extremes. So, therefore, we can only use that thermometer to measure known temperatures because it's been calibrated. Okay? All that to say this. The Bible's teaching on the pillars of the earth or the foundations of the earth or the, 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 the bars of the earth or the foundations of the mountains, the pillars upon which the mountains or the earth rest, none of that is teaching anything other than around earth because he specifically said that when he was at the bottom of the mountains, the earth was around him. And he said that the earth is hung upon nothing in the empty place. So again, it, this is just a lame attempt for man who knows nothing about what's below the mountains, who's never been below the mountains, who has no clue. And it, look, it talked about fire, setting on fire the foundations of the mountains. They've never been there. They have no clue. The Bible knows way about it than they do, way more about it than they do. So I just, who's just going to trust what the Bible said? Just the pillars of the earth, the pillars of the earth. Go back to the book of Job. Not only that, obviously, it, it's poetry. Both the passage in 1 Samuel 2 and the passage in Job 9 are poetry, which in poetry often exaggerations occur, don't they? In poetry, even in the Bible's poetry, there's exaggeration, there's hyperbole that's used. And so to just try to just literally take it as like a literal pillar, you know, is, is, is kind of stretching it. When in reality, there's some kind of a foundation to the mountains. We know that. We know that the earth has some type of pillars or some type of foundation. We don't know what that structure is exactly like. And we don't know exactly what the core is like, but we know that it's fire and, and brimstone and that it's the location of hell. But let's, let's hurry up and finish here. It says in verse 9, "...which maketh Arcturus, Orion, and Pleiades, and the chambers of the south, which doeth great things past finding out, yea, and wonders without number." So we see that constellations are mentioned in the Bible. This shows that there's nothing wrong with looking up at the stars and, and charting the constellations. A lot of times this is associated with astrology and witchcraft. But the, the, the constellations or even the constellations of the zodiac don't necessarily have to serve a sorceress or witchcraft type of a purpose. You can still just look at them and use them to navigate. And, and there's a lot of uh, a use to looking up at the sky and... and knowing where the stars are and spotting the constellations. We were out soul winning today and we, I, I, my son and I literally spotted Orion and Pleiades both. They're actually visible tonight, even in Phoenix with all our city lights, because these are two of the most major constellations. Who thinks that they could look up at the sky and spot Orion? Pretty much everyone, right? Only like half the hands are going up. But anyway, it's, it's pretty easy to spot because there's the three stars right in a row, the belt of Orion. And then who thinks that they could walk out there and, and spot Pleiades right now in the sky? All right. About um, all of my kids and one other person. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's, once you spot it, like if I show it to you, you'll be able to spot it again because it's really easy to see. It's this little tight cluster of seven really bright stars, and they're all clustered right together. And so once you see it one time, you'll be able to spot it again after that uh, forever because it's really easy to spot. But, you know, he's mentioning these, these constellations, these stars, and, and so forth, just that God created these. And, and some of the stars, it's interesting, and I don't want to go into a big thing on the stars because I'm, I'm not really an expert on, on stars or anything. But I do know this. When you look up at the stars, it's interesting how if you go to a place that's really dark, when you're away from the city lights, you see so many stars that sometimes it's almost hard to make out the constellations just because everything's so bright. I mean, sometimes you just look up and it says billions of stars and they're just stars everywhere but on a less clear night there are only certain stars that are visible and have you noticed that there's a really clear distinction between the really bright stars that you can see no matter how clear it is 
and the ones that you can only see on a really clear night. Have you noticed that? And, and, and it, they do seem to make pictures, the ones that are really bright. You know, the one, there's, there's just the backdrop of just billions and billions of stars, but there are certain stars that kind of come to the forefront as much brighter on a, uh, on a Phoenix City night. They're the only ones you can see. And they do seem to form pictures. And, you know, obviously God created it that way. And he created these constellations because he even mentions it as that he made Orion and Pleiades. And so I do think that the stars are making pictures and that it's not just necessarily in people's imagination that the stars are laid out that way. But anyway, that's, that's kind of a deep topic that I'm not really interested in going off on right now. But it says in verse 13, I, I'm just going to hurry up through a few more things. Uh, if God will not withdraw his anger, the proud helpers do stoop under him. How much less shall I answer him and choose out my words to reason with him? Whom though I were righteous, yet would I not answer. But I would make supplication to my judge. If I had called and he had answered me, yet would I not believe that he had hearkened unto my voice. For he breaketh me with a tempest and multiplieth my wounds without cause. He will not suffer me to take my breath, but filleth me with bitterness. If I speak of strength, lo, he is strong. And if of judgment, who shall set me a time to plead? So he's just talking about the fact that God's doing all these horrible things to him and bringing him through all this misery. And that, you know, he knows that he's not perfect. He knows that he's not without sin. But obviously God's punishing him. I mean, what's he going to do? He can't, he can't really argue with God. Can't fight against God. I, you know, I'm not going to plead against God. And then we already talked about verses 20 and 21. Uh, but it says in verse 22, this is one thing. Therefore, I said it. He destroyeth the perfect and the wicked. He's saying, look, bad things happen to good people and bad people. You know, it just everybody goes through suffering. Everybody uh, is going to have God's hand against them at some point, which, which is true. If the scourge slay suddenly, he will laugh at the trial of the innocent. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. Isn't that the truth? I mean, who runs the world that we live in? The rulers of the darkness of this world. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Our nation is run by the wicked. Our, you know, the United Nations is run by wickedness. You know, the whole world is in darkness. We're of the light. We're of the truth. But the Bible says here... The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. That's why uh, Satan is called the God of this world. He covereth the faces of the judges thereof. If not, where and who is he? Now my days are swifter than a post. They flee away. They see no good. They are passed away as the swift ships, as the eagle that hastes to the prey. Do you notice how he says everything twice? Every single thing is said twice. That, that's a poetic device of the book of Job. If I say I will forget my complaint, I will leave off my heaviness and comfort myself. I am afraid of all my sorrows. I know that thou wilt not hold me innocent. Who's the thou? Not God. Because every time God is referred to in this chapter, it's always he and him about God. Who's he talking to? Bildad. So is it, sometimes it can be confusing. Sometimes at first glance, I know I've looked at this and I'll think that the thou's are about God. Especially back in chapters, um, chapter 6 and 7 when he's talking to Eliphaz. It, it seems like a few times that he's talking to God, but if you look really carefully, usually the these and the thous is him referring to the person he's talking to. And he usually talks about God in the third person, unless he says, I'll say unto God, then he'll start saying thou to God. But usually when he says he, him, his, it's God. And when he says thee, thou, thine, he's actually talking to Bildad. Because look what he says in, um, uh, in verse 28, I am... I am afraid of all my sorrows. I know that thou will not hold me innocent. They, his friends are not holding him innocent. And then he says, if I be wicked, why then, I, why then labor I in vain? If I wash myself with snow water and make my hands never so clean, yet shalt thou plunge me in the ditch. You know, they're throwing him under the bus. They're plunging him into the ditch. That's who he's talking to, actually. If you look at it real carefully, you'll, you'll see what I mean. If you look at all the chapters and notice when he talks about God as he... And when he talks to the friends as thou, uh, it says in verse number 32, for he is not a man as I am that I should answer him and we could come together in judgment. See, that's when he's talking about God. See how he switches to he. Now watch this. Neither is there any daysman betwixt us that might lay his hand upon us both. Let him take 
is wrought away from me and let not his fear terrify me, then would I speak and not fear him, but it is not so with me. The last thing I want to cover is verse 33, where it says, Neither is there any daysman betwixt us that might lay his hand upon us both. Now you might look at the word daysman and say that is an archaic word. And I agree that that is not a word that we use today in our modern vernacular. And of course, people are often criticizing the King James Bible for using archaic words. And this would be one that they would point to and say this word daysman is outdated. And here's what they'll say. Nobody knows what it means. But can anybody honestly say that they've read this verse and they can't figure out what that word means? It's pretty obvious, right? Because what are the last three letters? Man. So we're talking about a person, right? And we're talking about a person who's going to lay his hands on two people and basically mediate between them. Because he says in verse 32, he's not a man as I am that I should answer him and we should come together in judgment. He's saying, look, God's not a, a man in the sense that I could just walk up to him and sit down and talk to him and, and God and I could work this out. Neither is there any daysman betwixt us that might lay his hand upon us both. And, and think about this laying a hand on both. Let's say there's an argument, because basically he's talking about the, the, if there's a dispute between him and God. Well, let's say there's a dispute between Brother Garrett and Brother Matt. Okay. And they're upset and they're, they're, they're fighting, they're angry. And I want to come in and help them reach some kind of an agreement. You know, I might get between them and put my hand on each of them. Maybe, you know, people are fighting, you kind of push them apart. But not even that, just, you know, just walk up and just put it, because look, putting a hand on someone is a sign of what? Affection, right? Like, for example, the handshake, okay? It's a physical contact. You know, sometimes in other cultures, people will hug each other or do a handshake or maybe give kisses on the cheek, right? You know, sometimes you'll even see men greet each other by, you know, mm -hmm, you know just a different culture. But there's some kind of a physical contact, you know, whether it's a handshake, right? Or whether it's like, you know, something like that, you know, or you don't know all that. stuff. all right. But anyway, you know, whatever it is, it's just some kind of a physical contact. Just it's a show of friendship or affection or love. So basically he says a day's me. He's going to put a hand on both of us, meaning that he's not taking one side. He's not, you know, siding with one against the other, but he's somebody who's between the two trying to bring both sides together, trying to, to be a go-between or a mediator. And, and so our modern word here that we'd probably use would be the word mediator, which is used elsewhere in the Bible. He's saying there's not a mediator between us that might lay his hand upon us both. And of course, Jesus Christ is that mediator because Jesus Christ came to this earth, God in the form of man, bridging the gap between God and man. And the Bible says there's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. It also says in Hebrews over and over again that he is the mediator of the New Testament. He is the mediator of the New Covenant. What does that mean? The Bible says a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. When someone dies, a lot of times they have a last will and testament. Okay, so let's say I wrote out my last will and testament and I said this money is going to go to this person and this money is going to go to this person and this house is going to go to this person, you know, all the stuff that I don't have. But anyway, you know, I list off all these things and say this is how it's going to be divvied up. Well, a lot of times there will be the executor of that will, right? And that executor of the will will, will go over that and, and interpret it and, and, you know, make sure that everybody understands the terms to keep, you know, some families, the siblings might fight each other and hate each other because they're just greedy of money. So that's where, you know, the executor is there to be an impartial guy to make sure that everybody gets what, what they're supposed to get. OK, so that the testament or, or the, 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 the covenant uh, has a mediator. And, and the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the mediator of of the new covenant or the mediator of the new testament now jesus is also described as our advocate and an advocate is another word for a lawyer and the bible says my little children these things write i unto you that ye sin not but if any man sin we have an advocate with the father jesus christ the righteous so what does that mean well if we were in a courtroom i don't necessarily want to talk straight to the judge i know that when i was on trial I never uh, spoke to the judge myself, and, nor did I speak to the jury myself, you know, until after the trial was over. 
I sat there and just didn't say a word the whole trial. I just remained silent the entire time. But I had someone there that was an advocate for me, that was basically a mediator between me and the jury and a mediator between me and the judge. Because I don't know all the ins and outs of the law. I'm not an expert on criminal defense. So therefore, I don't want to just go in there and just start saying stuff and you know say all the wrong things and make a lot of legal mistakes. So I have somebody there who's speaking up for me, who's standing up for me and saying what I would say. So when Jesus is our advocate, what that means is that God the Father, the judge of the universe, in his eyes were condemned. Yeah. Right? Because we've sinned. Jesus Christ is there to basically step in and say... It's paid for. You know, it's under the blood. It's, it, he's, he's been forgiven. The sins are forgotten. And the devil is like the prosecuting attorney because he's called the accuser of the brethren, which accuses them before God day and night. So if you can imagine up in heaven, the devil accusing someone before the father. And then you can see Jesus sticking up for you, stepping in and saying, no, wait a minute. Here's what's really going on. And, and so that's what Jesus says. He's, a, he's the mediator between God and men. And, and uh, he's the only mediator. Not Mary, also known as the mediatrix to Catholics. Uh, there is no other mediator. The pastor is not a mediator. We go directly to the Father through the Son. He is our daysman. He is the daysman betwixt us. He is the one who lays his hand on us both. Okay, it's not that he doesn't want to do the will of the Father because Jesus said, I always do those things which please him. But he also loves and cares for our interest and he brings both sides together. And to do that, of course, he had to sacrifice himself. He had to die on the cross to satisfy the Father. You know, he's trying to satisfy both sides. He doesn't want this side to go to hell, you know, human side. He loves us, wants us saved. But then also he has to satisfy the justice of the Father. And his holiness and his righteousness. And so he did that by sacrificing himself to pay the penalty, to pay the price that we owe for our sins and satisfy the father's just demands. And also to allow us a free entry into heaven, which otherwise we would, we would have no way of being saved. And so it's just interesting that, that uh, Job brings this up. And says, he's not a man as I am that I should answer him and we should come together in judgment. Neither is there any daysman betwixt us that might lay his hand upon us both. But thank God we do have that daysman in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, God came and was manifest in the flesh and dwelt among us. Obviously, that had not yet happened at this time. He had not yet come to this earth. But let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the book of Job. And, and Lord, thank you that your word is so much more reliable than all this false, phony, uh, fraudulent science, falsely so called, th that's constantly being proven wrong. And they constantly have to rethink everything because it turns out they were wrong because they make so many guesses and theories and speculations that then turn out to be wrong. But they like to go around stating them as fact, the, the pompous, prideful, uh, arrogant fools that they are. They state their, their guesses and hypotheses and speculation as fact, when in reality the book I'm holding in my hand is fact. Thank you, Lord, that we can trust it. And thank you that we have a rock of our salvation, the Holy Bible. And we know that what it says is true. And uh, thank you so much for the book of Job that can, that can teach us so many things about suffering, and, and help us to understand that none of us is, is, is righteous. None of us is perfect. We've all sinned. And, uh, you know, God's going to allow bad things in our lives and, and, and afflictions are going to happen. Just help us to be strong and to stay the course of, of loving and serving you. And in Jesus' name.